Uh, my name is Gino Kelly, and uh, I actually hail from Florida. This is my second time in Argentina, um, and I've always, uh, I'm always real thankful when I get invited back because I love, uh, I love coming here. Um, just a little bit about my background. I'm a former secondary math teacher, um, and I did that for many years, uh, working uh, primarily with disadvantaged youth. Uh, so these are kids that are typically in danger of not graduating uh, from school. So uh, the first challenge was getting them to school. Uh, the second challenge was keeping them in school. And then the third challenge, oddly enough, was teaching them mathematics. So it was, it was a trifecta of a challenge. Um, but in my years, um, I've also taken a keen interest on technology and how technology can help serve uh, some type of a meaningful purpose in terms of how we use it in the classroom. And so what I'd like to share with you um, is just some examples um, and some ideas that in my time I've come across that I think can help in terms of mathematics instruction and how we can uh, enhance that instruction using technology. Specifically, um, I've been using these technologies now for the last few years and really thinking about ways in which these technologies can help support teachers uh, not only become more efficient in their teaching but also uh, to help uh, them create lessons that kind of deepen the understanding of mathematics for students. So we're going to be using uh, these devices here um, alongside some of the stuff here on the board. So I'm just going to hand these out to you guys. So um, we're going to look at uh, teaching and learning in, in general um, and think about really, you know, what does that mean in the context of mathematics and then within the subcontext of these particular technologies. So let me uh, start you off uh, with, with a little uh, personal story. Um, so I have two younger brothers um, that are both in college, and uh, one of them actually took a calculus class last semester. And he calls me at the beginning of the, uh, beginning of the year and says, um, can you help me, right? Can you help me with my homework and stuff? And so um, I said, sure, not a problem. Uh, we'll get on Skype, and we'll, I'll help you with your, your homework problems, right? And uh, so we did that throughout the semester and um, came across, across this problem that his professor had given him. And uh, if you guys remember calculus back in the day, this is on Riemann sums, which uh, is a bit obscure. You can forget about it real quickly. And, uh, and I had forgotten because I hadn't done uh, calculus in, uh, in a couple of years. So I said to him, let me go home, or let me go back um, and figure this problem out, you know, so I can refresh my memory. Um, and then I'll call you back. So um, I hung up and I spent literally three and a half hours trying to work this problem out because I just couldn't remember all this stuff. I had to kind of relearn it. So here's the problem, and this is all the work that I did to try to figure out the solution. And after three and a half hours, I finally figured out the solution that was a static. So I called him, I said, hey, get on Skype, because um, I figured out the problem, I'm gonna show you how to do it. And he says to me, oh, it's okay, I figured it out already. And I said, you figured it out? He's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, well, how long did it take you? It took me five minutes. And I said, well, you have to, you have to show me, because this might be some new method that your professor came up with that I don't know about. And he says, all right, sure. So we get on Skype, and I go, so how did you solve the problem? He said, it was real simple. Um, I found this, uh, this website called Yahoo Answers. <laughs> <laughs> and I typed in my question. Okay, now if you notice, the question is exactly as it's teacher asked it. Okay, with the picture. Here's the picture. And then all he did was just found some guy who had given him the answer. So he copied down the answer and put the uh, solution, got it right, right? To which my response to him was, among other things, right? Um, how are you gonna do this on the test? <laughs> you can't get online on the test. Oh, it's okay because it's easy because the way he teaches, he just memorizes steps. So I memorize the steps and he's just gonna change the numbers and when he changes the numbers, I'll just, I'll know the steps and so I'll get it right. And, uh, and at that point, I thought to myself, um, well, that's not really learning, is it? It's not really teaching. You know, um, and this is some of the challenges that teachers face today, right? Is that students have uh, available information and available answers everywhere. It doesn't matter, right? What they have. So it's not a sense of giving them questions that simply ask them to regurgitate information or memorize information um, because they can find the answers really simply. The question now becomes is how do, how do we instruct in a way that helps them think more deeply about the mathematics that's going on, right? And more importantly, how do you connect that to everyday life, right? Which is a huge uh, undertaking. So let me uh, start you off with a math problem. So we're going to do this together, okay? So here's a question that I'd like to propose to you. And it says, we're at a rock concert and we're at a, on a field that's re re rectangular in shape. The dimensions are 100 meters by 50 meters, okay? Now the concert was completely sold out. So your challenge is to tell me 
which one of the following estimates that I'm about to show you, okay, uh, or numbers, excuse me, would be the best estimate for the total number of people attending this concert? So I'm going to give you a little bit of time, okay, and when you think you've uh, come up with a solution, go ahead and use your devices to input your answer, okay, A, B, C, D, or E, okay. Which one do you think is the best estimate for this, uh, this particular problem? So which one of these numbers? Just put in the number. And then, and then uh, your answer will come to you. Once you figure it out. Uh, okay. 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 So um, most of you said 20,000. One of you said three. Um, so that, may, that must have been, uh, well, let's see, three. You meant C is what you meant. Okay, very good. All right, very good. So that's one way to give a problem to math students. As a matter of fact, this is typically the way we give problems to math students, right? When you look in math books, textbooks, this is what you see, a lot of words. So what tends to happen here? What if you have students who are maybe not as proficient literate? in literacy. In other words, they, uh, they have problems reading. Right? All of a sudden now, there's a level of complexity there that uh, prevents them from actually doing the mathematics. The other question you might be asking yourself is, uh, if I pose this problem to you and say to you, is this a good math problem? Would you agree or not? Would this be a good math problem? Maybe. Ideas? Maybe? Okay. Some say, yeah, I think it's pretty good. Some say, no, it's a horrible math problem because there's no math going on here, right? Is there any, is there any higher level mathematics going on here? Well, it may be on how you uh, look at this problem, right? The perspective from which you see. So if we look at this problem, really there's four or five key things that we need to know, right? Uh, what we're looking at here, the figure, the size, and then what is the actual question? And what we can do is we can actually provide a visual to students to help them conceptualize this more, okay? Now this is a problem that, that's actually uh, given on an international assessment, okay? And for this particular prize, it's one of the lowest scoring problems all over the world. And so researchers are fascinated. Why, why is this problem so ambiguous to students? Why do you suppose it's ambiguous? And incidentally, my friends, um, you all said 20,000, okay? The answer is actually 5,000, okay, 5,000. Because there's, there's a, a bit here um, that often gets overlooked, and that's that um, all the fans are standing. Okay? Which means that the problem is trying to make it imply that for each square unit, you can actually fit more than one person. Okay? Which makes it more people. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay? And so what happens is kids don't see this. Okay? This is where the disconnect is. All right? And so the challenge then becomes, well, how do we help them see that? If we're math teachers, how do we help them see that? Well, what if we took this problem and uh, simply uh, did something different with it, right? So we're going to go um, in here. I found this, uh, uh, this stadium that you guys have here um, in this city. And if we go in there, uh, what we can do is I can pose this problem to you in the same way, okay? So here's this city here. And uh, what I want to do is just ask you if the state, if the stage is here, and I give you dimensions for this, by the way, we have the real life dimensions here. If I give you dimensions for this, and I make the grid out of it, and I ask you the question, do you think then that that becomes more explicit for students than simply just giving them the words, okay? And so when we think about mathematics, this is kind of the way we have to, uh, perspective that we have to think about, is how do we use media to help enhance the instruction of mathematics. So that's um, one small example to show you this. Um, so let me let me go through a couple of more. Um, there's something really, really important that needs to be understood about using these particular technologies. When we talk about interactivity, we can walk into a classroom and see a teacher doing a lot of things, moving things around, maybe the kids are moving things around, and things are happening, okay? But you have to ask a question. Other than this kind of stuff, where things are moving on the screen, is anything else going on, okay? And if there's not, then we're not maximize, uh, maximizing the potential of these technologies. 
So I'd like for, uh, to propose to you three types of interactivity, okay, that we need to think about for all types of uh, lessons that we create, not just mathematics. Typically, we see this, uh, what we call interaction with the interface, which is nothing more than dragging things, clicking on things, and other things happen, actions, right? But when you think about what's going on up here with the students as you're watching the content, if there's nothing going on there, if there's no processes that are, that are being uh, developed, then you're not taking full advantage of what you could do. So what you want to have also are what we call cognitive interactions. Okay, and that is how do I interact <coughs> with what you're doing here, what the teacher is doing, interact with what's going on up here with the student? How are they processing the information that you're uh, delivering? And that goes alongside a third type of interaction, which we call so, uh, socio-cognitive interaction, uh, which basically means what type of student-student and teacher-student uh, dialogues are you having in the classroom? Okay. And it's a combination of these three types of interactions that truly form what we uh, typically call an interactive classroom. So to make this uh, a little bit more clear, I'm going to show you just examples of each of these to, uh, to give you an idea. 